uh, urban level is not very good either. <coughs> My question really for the panel and anyone who's got good news on examples where rapid urbanization has been well handled. Mm. Um, at the moment we're talking about Africa, but it could apply almost anywhere in the world. That would be very interesting to hear. Mm. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to take a few and then I'm, um, next down here, yes, and then I'm going to come into the middle for a few. Uh, hi, uh, Jia Shun, the University of Birmingham. I'd like to go back to the first presentation on African uh, success stories, um, especially the talk about, uh, I mean, the issues about how they gain success stories through uh, liberalization, removal of trade barriers, and um, those areas. Uh, I'm wondering, if, does this not go back to the same tenets as the Washington consensus, mm -hmm. and what pace were, was, were these liberalizations or uh, removal of any uh, controls uh, taken, and uh, were there any? What could you? Were there any social safety nets? And with all these success stories, are, is this more of a short-term success stories where we get numbers that show, like health, health is uh, health is improving, uh, poverty is reducing? Is this a short-term success story, or will it be in the long term? Uh, uh, long term transformational uh, success story. Okay. Good. Keep a catalogue because we're going to take a few more. I've got three in a row here. Thank you. Matthew Cadbury, Vice President, UN Women, UK. Uh, Africa has more barriers to trade than any other continent. Mm. How important is that and what prospects are there to make significant improvement? Great, thank you. Next to you. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Osman Bashir from uh, London South Bank University. Uh, I'm wondering why the two researchers forgot to mention about Ethiopia, mostly the, the coffee sector, because Ethiopia is home to Arabica coffee. And there is great improvement in the country where I've been going back for the last three years for my research. And there are more than, in one region only in Oromia, there is one, more than 140 cooperatives, coffee cooperatives only. And they directly export their coffee and they are highly developed in specialty coffee. Okay. Well, this is one. And the other one is really, Ethiopia is making a great progress. For the last five years, growth rate per annum was 11%, really. It, and the infrastructure, is so great. Mm. I wonder, it might be on your website, but <laughs> at least one of them would have mentioned that country. Thank you. Yeah. Well, yeah. to be fair, yeah. they, it is, but it's not Ethiopia coffee. There's yeah. another success story from Ethiopia. Over here, and then I'm going to get a few comments and we'll go out again. Oh, Thank you. My, my name is Fraser Wheeler. I was in the Foreign Office re until recently, and I'm now a consultant on low carbon development. Uh, uh, touching on Will's um, last comment, I'd be interested in uh, the panel think, how can the donor institutions uh, best facilitate uh, drawing on the progress that's been made, the lessons learned, how can they best facilitate Africa getting a competitive advantage in low carbon development? Mm, Thank you. Good question. Let me just take the one there at the back, and then I'm going to ask for some comments. Yeah. I'm Alice uh, uh, from Uganda. A student, PhD student in education, uh, Dublin Trinity College. My question is uh, in the area of education. I heard from the first uh, speaker that yes, there has been a great increase in enrollment, and uh, retention rate is good, and completion rate is also good. But what is what strategies or um, policies are laid in place? to sustain this amount of students who in a few uh, years to come will come out as graduates. How are they going to be sustained in the workforce? Since many of these developing countries, I see from Uganda, although it has uh, made a lot of progress, but um, the tea, coffee, and many other agricultural uh, products are still to be transported out for processing. So. Where are these people going to be uh, taken in after their education? Thank okay, you. thank you very much. So jobs for people once they've been educated. Thank you. Okay, um, Poonam, let me ask you to maybe re react a little bit to the points around, you know, 
Is this is this just another way of presenting a kind of Washington consensus, pay, maybe packaged in a different language? Um, and also the point about barriers to trade, <coughs> which are a particular um, uh, and, and, and standout issue for, for, for African economies. Uh, sure. I th um, let me just say, I think the questions are really very interesting. And um, it's not that uh, one might have all the, all the answers for no, it. No, no, indeed. Um, but going back to your issue of, um, you know, is this the Washington consensus or not? If you recall, one of our panelists, I think, Will said that uh, what business is looking for is mm -hmm. uh, reduced uncertainty and, um, and, and sort of, I think, more in investor-friendly kind of climate. And this is not just for foreign investors. This is for local investors. So if you want Africa to be growing in terms of a dynamic private sector, then they're looking for the same kinds of things. And when you're looking for reduced uncertainty in terms of inflation and exchange rate and, and volatility in, in prices, then um, you know if, if, if you have more prudent macroeconomic policies that, that ensure that, what's wrong with that? Um, I mean, that's, uh, we've, been, we've been on the other side where the government has tried to get into everything, tried to be both on, in the input markets and the output markets, and the result was that <coughs> most African countries were not growing. There was, there was a period when, when growth was really weak, as we saw in the chart that I put up earlier in the 1980s. It's only when they liberalized and, and improved um, the, the market environment that you see this dynamism and growth. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, there was one question that I thought was very, very interesting on, on education in Uganda. Um, we actually have that as a success story. I think, Elizabeth, Ethiopia. you might, uh, might have it. Was it Ethiopia or Uganda? Uh, I thought it was Uganda. Was it Uganda or Ethiopia? But the question is, is, uh, that you asked was, was very relevant. We have more people going into, uh, kids going into pri uh, you know, primary school and then going into secondary school. Uh, what are the skills that they're learning? And are they learning? And are these the skills that are going to be needed in the workplace? And we know that in Africa, there's a big issue with, with unemployment, and especially youth unemployment. So I think that's clearly an area which needs more, more research and more um, sort of a hard look at what should be, be the policies in terms of what, what, are, what children should be learning, you know, and students <coughs> should be learning, and uh, the skills, and skills moving forward, you know, for, for the sort of modern kind of uh, economy. I think there was a question on, on trade barriers. Mm, mm. Um, yes, uh, there are, um, I guess, trade barriers, uh, including sort of regional ones, and then, of course, uh, you know, trading with, with the rest of the world. But sometimes the more um, important issues are actually sort of within the borders, where there, there are infrastructure kinds of constraints and, and you know, uh, the other kinds of logistics which, which actually um, make it very expensive for, um, for, for uh, <coughs> Producers and, 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 and the private sector um, to, to be more more uh, competitive. Mm, very good, thank you. Um, I was going to ask um, this, but I mean, this issue we've, it's a bit of a vexed issue. This urban issue, um, here, as you know, and we have long chats about this. Absolutely, you know, we feel uh, here in ODI very strongly we should be doing much more work around the, the urban agenda. But it is a bit of a, a kind of movable feast. And one thing we did try to actively look for in in coming up with progress stories was one that would tell us something about you know, change within an urban context. I'm not sure in the end. Did we come up with some? Well, I Water. Guess, yes, I Burkina think Faso. We, we can actually get Peter <laughs> in now, who can tell a story about, um, yes, water in Burkina Faso and addressing challenges and access. Yes, thanks very much, Peter Newborn, ODI Research Associate. Yes, we looked at Burkina, and uh, as you may know, Ouagadougou and other cities have encountered uh, a, a very substantial population growth rate, 4%, I think, in the decade from the 90 to 2000. So how on earth do you provide water services to, to a city which is growing so fast? Well, the answer has been pretty well. This is a, a definite progress story um, in that the utility on air turned around its performance. The leadership was smart. The support with, from government was good. And the delivery of new services was extensive with a, a major injection of capital, mostly ODA. Now, the question is how to sustain that. And there's another round of funding coming in for this, the capital Ouagadougou and other cities. So that seems to be very positive. I mean, I suppose the question is, uh, in this good story of progress, is progress for whom? And I think the answer is that this glass is definitely half full. 
but Onea was not able really to tell us who is in the glass in that they are very busy connecting people <laughs> and that is obviously very positive but the information they carry on their customers as in many places in Africa is pretty slight so for development people social development people who want certainty on benefits for women children and low income households um, there's a bit of a gap, I think, in information. The business and commercial progress, the engineering progress was good. In terms of equity, there's a question mark. But maybe Anea will be able to very shortly to fill that gap. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Peter. I'm glad we brought you in. Will, have you got something yes, on there? Yes, can I, can I, I must mm. declare a little interest because I chair a, 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 a water, a sanitation uh, organisation focusing just on urban and peri-urban. Uh, poor and uh, it's, it's really good to hear a good news story about municipal competence because I think that feels to me the, the exception rather than the rule mm -hmm. and, and it is the stumbling block uh, it's an obvious market failure there are you know, a long list of reasons why and with Africa's population you know, set to increase by 50% in the next 20 years all of whom will be in cities basically uh, it's an absolutely extraordinary challenge and I, you know, I don't think ODI is alone in not really working out how to deal with it if it certainly hasn't either um, in, in my impression, in the sense that it seems to have gone out with the bathwater a bit in the last six months. Mark, can, you're you know, probably hotly denied that, but it feels like it as an observer, <laughs> which I think is a shame because actually it's an area where relatively targeted and modest uh, inputs, particularly around, uh, around municipal governance and capacity, can have a really disproportionate impact and the opportunity to bring <coughs> private sector and communities together in a well-regulated framework with competent government could you know, answer an awful lot of problems. So I think there's something in there where there's a trick we're kind of missing. Mm -hmm. OK. I'm going to open it up a bit more to this side of the room, and then I'll come back again if we've got time. Um, I'm going to go over there, and I'll come back. Right at the back. Hi. Um, Simon O'Mealy uh, moved to Care International, formerly at ODI. I wrote um, a couple of the papers on progress in water and sanitation. There's just one, one issue that I'd like to flag from, from looking at my uh, research and, and writing around um, the Ugandan story. Uh, and there was notable progress in terms of delivery of uh, water services in rural areas, and the, 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 the <coughs> figures seem to, to back that up quite convincingly. And one of the issues that didn't come out so much in, in Lisbeth's presentation, but it was implicit, was the issue of politics uh, and power within, within the country. And what, what I mean by that is, what was absolutely central in the Ugandan story was that there was, um, driven to a large extent by, by Museveni, a, um, a strong political support for the poverty agenda. Uh, and this came, there was, a, if you like, a confluence of factors. This strong political support that was backed by a uh, Ministry of Finance that was relatively um, autonomous and, and well-functioning, alongside a Ministry of Water and Environment with um, strong leadership who were able to connect the dots and to put forward their agenda on pro-poor uh, water service delivery with the, the wider political project of um, dealing with poverty and this being, being fundamental to what Museveni saw as, as his route to staying in power. And I think that is absolutely a, a key message that, that yeah. came through on that. Um, I think more broadly what it's about, we need to think about the, the wider logic of the political system and how that in Uganda has, it can change over time. And, and what we've actually seen in Uganda is that the, the political priorities around the poverty agenda are shifting uh, to a reduction in social sector spending, to uh, a situation in which there's a focus on export-driven modernization and macroeconomic stability, and a reduction in, in spending in those sectors. So I think we are, we are challenged with how do we, we may know technically to just to, com just to finished, going back to the comment from our colleague from Gates, we may know technically where the best policies should be targeted, but I would mm -hmm. like us to go much further and say, but how can we, given political realities, encourage political systems to, to move in that direction? Okay, very good. Thank you. Um, there's a gentleman on the end here. Just wait for the mic, please. Uh, David Norse, uh, UCL. Uh, two quick questions. One, uh, it's about the follow-up to case studies. Okay, there was a whole series done by the World Bank in the 1980s, another set done by FAO in the 1990s, mm -hmm. and I don't really think they've had uh, the benefits that they could have had mm. if they were followed up correctly. Uh, the second is about <coughs> infrastructure. You both referred to infrastructure. Uh, 
lots of examples of market failure due to uh, infrastructure. Who, apart from the Chinese, is prepared to actually put money into infrastructure? <laughs> That's an interesting point. I'm at Mark. I'm going to ask you that question. I thought you were giving me a choice. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, on infra infrastructure, um, the main source of finance for infrastructure in most places, it, it, in a lot of sectors, really ought to be the private sector. Mm. And so there's a big issue for um, development finance organisations about PPPs and how to get better at doing PPPs. Um, and I, I think, actually, in some places there are some really interesting things happening. I follow quite closely the um, evolution of the power sector in Nigeria. Um, and I think there's a, you know, there, there are some really positive things happening after a long, long period of collapse and terrible mess. I think also the um, transport sector in most countries is a, is a bit better on the infrastructure side. Obviously, the telecom sector is not bad. I think people who say that the water sector is not handled at all well, especially in the urban environment, are right, actually. And the involvement of the private sector in the water sector in lots of cities in many developing countries has been pretty disastrous. Um, of course, if you go back to 19th century London, the water um, arrangements were not fantastic either. So. Um, this is clearly an area for improvement. I'm going to resist Will's temptation to add this to the DFID um, agenda. Could I just say a couple of things on Ethiopia? Because I, I thought um, your point was very well taken. We um, have a challenge fund which is trying to help countries get better value added from, its, from their discrete products. So, you know, the world's best clarinets are made from a Tanzanian hardwood. Um, the world's best uh, golf courses have kikuyu grass on them. Um, the world's most value-adding whiskey comes from Scotland. It's all about the brand. I think that's exactly the route to go with coffee. And so when I go to my supermarket, I buy Sidamo rather than Ethiopian, if you, if you appreciate the distinction I'm making. I mean, you, you can get brand value from... Um, carving up your market in a different kind of way. And I think there's, there's a lot of opportunity there. Second thing on Ethiopia is um, low carbon and brings me back to power. Seven of the top ten, certainly in Africa, maybe global um, hydro potential opportunities are in Ethiopia. Some of them being developed now, some not. Great potential for export in the region to help other countries meet their power needs. Mm. Thank you very much. I mean, pa Patrick, is there anything... I mean, there are a number of points there about, I mean, sort of managing political context. You talk very eloquently about leadership and vision in the Rwandan context, but there are other issues raised about ha navigating those politics and lining them up, if you like, with the development project. Have you got any further thoughts on that? Well, um, I, th I, th I, th I think it's uh, pretty straightforward. He raises a, a very legitimate point about uh, using the, the, that to get his <coughs> votes. Uh, but so long as you have a, a <coughs> institution that you can follow, so long as you have a vision, you have a plan uh, that everybody has adhered to and uh, uh, wants to follow, uh, I don't think we'll be getting these. And that's slowly where we're creeping towards in terms of uh, better governance. Uh, because at the end of the day, with all the success stories and, and everything has been mentioned here, uh, governance plays a very critical role. Uh, mm. in terms of development. Mm. So if, if, if we don't have that good governance, a lot of the stuff will be left on the wayside. But his, his point is very well noted, mm. and it's very true. Thank you. Liz, but there was a point about are these successes flash in the pan? Are these progress stories just stories of a, of a particular time frame? And I, I'm both you addressed issues of how the progress stories were identified, but could you just reiterate what, over what time frame we were talking about? Um, we try to find stories that were uh, that had sustained progress for at least ten years. Now we made a couple of exceptions on that in the potentials category because we thought the evidence was strong. But I think most of the stories are sort of from the early nineties, have been ongoing since then. Um, so we would suspect or expect mm. them um, to continue, they're pretty solid. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, we, we sort of looked at a longer time period and uh, because we weren't doing 
um, brand new research, what we are doing is uh, analysis of what had already happened, what others had sort of written about and, and, and discussed and analyzed, and pull it together and then try to sort of tweak out, you know, what, what are the issues that emerge from that. So these were, by and large, successes that have been there for some time, had been analyzed, and um, they sort of met the kinds of desirable things that we'd like to see in, in progress so, um, and, and development. So that's the way we were looking at it. Now, uh, it is important to remember that successes on, you know, that were successes yesterday are not necessarily going to continue to be successes in the future because it's a dynamic process um, and policies mm -hmm. change. Um, but that, but we did want to go with at least the large amount of them were sort of well established, and then they were the ones, uh, you know, which were uh, which which had not been discussed that much, but were successful. Uh, and then uh, you know there were some that were the potential are they or are they not. Um, Alison, if I can mm. just pick up on one Please issue, do. I think you made a very good point there on the political economy um, of change. And that's one of the things that uh, with uh, correcting government failures and policy distortions is that sometimes when it's also known that these policies are what are causing even more inefficiencies, it's difficult to actually redress them uh, appropriately because there are uh, powerful people within, within countries that are benefiting from this, you know, that are are able to get rent because of these policies. So change um, is is difficult. I think mm. it, it should be appreciated. So political economy mm. issues are very important. Mm. I mean, I think I'm I'm very struck by many of the progress stories that we've worked on. You know, one it, one is dealing with a very dynamic process, as you've indicated, and sometimes it's you know two foot two two steps forward, one step sideways, one step back, two steps forward, and it it's really capturing that and trying to identify the factors that have actually helped drive through those complex and often politically driven change processes. Um, do you want to comment on yeah, that? Just so, uh, uh, it, it's a story, okay? Success if it's one week or two weeks or 20 years, it's a success story. I actually like what uh, Mr. Lee was saying in terms of we need to tell these stories because uh, those stories, whether it's a short term or long term, it's still a story, it's still positive and it's still going to drive people. I think, I think that's what we should also keep in mind. Okay, very good. So I've got time for just one or two more comments, and then I'm going to sort of try and wrap something up. We've got one here, and then oh, oh yes, we'll come back to your view for sure. Don't worry. One here, and then one of it. And can you make them questions rather than comments, please? Yeah, um, I'm pleased to note uh, success stories, but are those success stories um, cases of um, huge disparities in regions? Uh, such as in Sri Lanka, which is written off by the DFID as middle-income country, whereas the Northeast um, is uh, world apart from, world away from uh, the rest of the country, about which the DFID has uh, said it's a middle-income country, where genocide is going on, where the minority rights group uh, and all the UN humanitarian affairs under Secretary General, they all have said that they have been horrified where journalists are not allowed to go in, where uh, aid okay. agents are not allowed Your to go in. Your question is, so is, this, is this based around yes. disparities? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. And over the back there, thanks. Um, I'm Janet Gruber, I'm a social development consultant and um, obviously not an economist. Now, we've talked about um, the economic aspects and the political economy. I would ask that we also consider the moral economy of um, <coughs> progress. And I can make a specific comment about Eritrea, where I lived and worked for quite a few mm. years, and there was mention of smart leadership. Now, I've worked on health in Eritrea. I know it's a complex issue, but I would question the fact that one could call the military command structure in Eritrea uh, and a political structure that really addresses rights and governance and equity mm. and so on. So not just for Eritrea, but more generally, I would, I would ask that the eventual report, I hope it does discuss those issues as well. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Um, it does indeed, and we struggled over Eritrea, I can tell you. Um, any other comments before I come back to the, to the whole panel? Okay. Um, so we've got a point there. Lisbeth, do you want to take this issue of disparities? I mean, are we just sort of highlighting you know, the, the, the cherry on the top rather than actually looking at the whole cake? Um, I mean, we actually have tried to identify some countries that have successfully incorporated the equity angle. That's why I was uh, saying earlier, um, 
in, her, in, in looking at progress and in measuring progress, one has to try and dis disaggregate and, and see w where countries have progressed, <coughs> but it hasn't been in an equitable way. Maybe we should put some, cre uh, some question marks. But then um, this is all relative. Uh, for example, if you look at Vietnam, which is in our set, um, huge growth everybody would say it's a it's a success story but decline in, in equity now vietnam started from a very good situation and they and they are now deteriorating which is certainly not a good thing but it's all sort of relative um, brazil on the other hand is making progress on improving equity but it started from an incredibly bad situation so you but we do have to look at this, and, and, and definitely the evidence is out there that um, uh, countries have to um, try and take that lower uh, income uh, quintile into account if they want to grow sustainably, because it, it will just um, come back into their faces if they leave a, a certain part of the, of the population out of the equation. Great, thank you very much. And I, th I think the point about Eritrea is probably well taken. Yes. The story is much more nuanced um, in a way because of precisely the reasons you raised. Will, can Africa become a market leader in low carbon development? Well, I certainly, I, I certainly don't think it should be investing heavily in things that are going to get very expensive very soon, <laughs> uh, like high carbon economies, when the rest of the world is busy going in the other direction. I mean, that feels like very short term thinking. And we shouldn't be encouraging them, and the World Bank shouldn't be lending to them, and DIBS shouldn't be supporting that. So, you know, there's a sort of logic in that. Uh, uh, what does Africa have? Lots of things that we need collectively and, and should be put to, you know, national advantage. Sunshine, space, soil, relatively few people, you know, lots of positives. So, you know, there is a real opportunity, but it does require, I think, a sort of vision and, and mind leap that says we will develop in a different a way in a, in a way that suits us and for the long term. Uh, I don't see much of that. My favorite word uh, in any language is, is Wabenzi, a uh, Swahili word that every child in Nairobi wishes to go and join the, the tribe of Mercedes-Benz drivers. And, and that's a perfectly human, understandable aspiration. And if we all achieve that, we're doomed. So I, you know, that we, we've got that as a fundamental tension. I think this is an opportunity for Africa. Uh, uh, the, the risk is it is perceived as a second class or is some way, in some way a lower level of development, and I absolutely contest that. Mm, absolutely, fantastic. Pinam Lisbeth, do you, want, do you have any last thoughts? Because otherwise I'm going to try and just wrap this up. Well, um, just one quick one, because it came up a few times, uh, people talking about equity issues, and you know, you talk, you, we have growth success stories. When we looked at the growth success stories, we, we tried to be mindful not just of the rate of growth, we also see whether the economy was diversified, uh, whether the benefits were spilling over to a larger uh, you know, population, and what is happening to poverty rates. So uh, it's not sort of a one-dimensional, uh, this country grew, so that's why it's a success story. It's actually the whole sort of package of uh, whether this was also, um, uh, you know, sustainable, and whether um, uh, you know other people, whether a larger uh, segment of the population benefited. Great, thank you. Um, I would say, sort of listening to all this, um, progress isn't about taking extreme positions. Um, I was just thinking, people raising this idea of Washington consensus. What are we doing? I think what we see in the progress stories is that as we were just discussing, governments have to be pragmatic and they have to think about the political context. They have to think about um, how they can facilitate political support, how they can prevent a costly disruption to production. So in some cases, they have to take a gradual approach to going towards the, the ideal situation, which may be the full liberalization. So I think we, we shouldn't be in, in one extreme or the other. It's, it's a process, um, and that counts for equity as well. Um, it's not because Vietnam is deteriorating in terms of its equity, we should throw it out. Um, it, it's, it's moving in a direction. Mm. Good. 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 Mark. Well, I'd just like to make one last um, observation, actually, which is, um, Gloom is a lot more prevalent in the human condition than um, excessive optimism is. It really surprises me that um, 
Matt Ridley's book, The Rational Optimist, mm. is not much more widely than it is, uh, read than it is. This is a book published last year, which is actually very, very positive mm. about the prospects and the, the opportunities for solving the problems we have today. I don't think we're going to change the human condition, mm. but we should all <laughs> read about what could get a lot better as well as could get worse. Very good. Well, I think that's a probably a good note for us to wrap it, actually. Thank you all very, very much indeed. To Poonam, uh, to Lisbeth, to Mark, to Patrick, Laurie, and to Will. I think this has been terrific. I think we've got a lot of material. Do please watch both the, the forthcoming book coming from the World Bank team and also the work and the final report coming out of the Development Progress work. It's all up there in the in the digital space and uh, we will continue hopefully do some more work around this uh, progress stories uh, initiative going forward i want to thank you all very very much indeed it's been a